uh, you know, obviously Odell Beckham Jr.'s father came out. He finally got, <laughs> finally got his, he couldn't stand no more. And he comes out and just says, listen, I got about 12 minutes of, <laughs> of, sh of showing my son being open and not getting the rock. And Twitter just goes crazy, goes nuts. Uh, what, <laughs> what was your thought when you uh, actually saw that situation go down? Well, when that happens, it's like, okay, they're, they're either going to do one of those things where they, they find, actually have a trade partner or they cut the guy and then somebody comes calling before the, you know, the actual official cut happens and they, they make a trade of like, like a third and a fifth or some, something like that. Right. You know, I would go on the radio and we, they, they say, do you got the Pittsburgh Steelers coming in last place and, you know, laughing at Ben Roethlisberger. And I just think it'd be funny how we get one playoff victory and they act like this man don't, don't got 23 wins and like, He's like 23, four or something and one against you. And once again, he comes out and does the Big Ben thing. Just enough to win. Just enough head he plays. Just enough production. And you end up losing a game that you could not lose at home going into another division game against the Bengals. What was your thought process on that game? Um, I mean, it was ugly, obviously. The, the defense did plenty enough to, to be able to win this game. Uh, if you know how I, I called Ronnie Harris and my X factor in this game. Well, <laughs> he kind of was, wasn't he? For the, yeah, he for the Steelers. Like he, he gave up the game when he touched down, he had a, a roughing the, uh, you know, a un, unsportsmanlike conduct or whatever, unnecessary roughness, or whatever, hitting Najee Harris late. Um, you know, this was the worst offensive performance by the Browns this year. It was worse than what they did against the Cardinals. Um, Cause at least against the Cardinals, like their pass protection was pretty good. Um, and, you know, that, that was, and the receiving was actually solid in that one. And this one, it was just nothing, nothing really was good. Not their run game, not their pass game. They couldn't really get it going at all. Um, when Baker Mayfield did find a, a, a open receiver and hit him, they, they seemed to drop it. Or when, you know, when he had an open receiver, he would miss him. So it, it's just, it was bad, bad offensive performance. So in, and a defensive performance, like led by Miles Garrett was, which was, I mean, he went off in this game, and it doesn't really show up on the stat sheet, but he just destroyed that left tackle in this game and had nothing to show for it. Last year might have been fool's gold. And let me tell you, that might have been a COVID year for them. You know, it's easy to come out last year where the whole country's in a pandemic, and all we care about is just seeing some games. We didn't even know we was going to have an NFL season. Nobody had an off season. They got empty stadiums. So, yeah. That was cool because that was all house money. Now, all of a sudden, you playing games that count. These guys are getting penalized, the most penalized team in the league. Personal fouls, like you said, Ronnie Harrison. Guy's 15 yards out of bounds, man. You know that. And then he hits him, and it looks like the next clip, he's over there talking to somebody drinking Kool-Aid, like yucking it up. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, is this Stefanski or Freddie Kitchens teams? I, I think kind of what unfolded today in social media and all that has been brewing in that locker room. You know, somebody's been cooking that up and there's been doubt being spread around the players and stuff like that. And when that is going on and, it, and then it, it manifests itself in social media, it's not something that was like all of a sudden out of the blue. Oh, where did this come from? When I see other teams play, those quarterbacks are the focal point of what they do. When Aaron Rodgers doesn't have his top two tackles, top three receivers, he goes and beats an a undefeated team and just like, oh, yeah, I'm I'm going I'm to do it how I feel like it. I, I can just get this done. When you see some of these other guys, it, 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 it hits you in your face like, we got to play perfect. Like, all the conditions have to be right for us to win. Like, it has to be good weather. It got to be all the receiving core, the whole offensive line, all of the tight ends. And the running game got to get 160 on the ground. It just seems like you got to play perfect. Like the room for error is just so small right now offensively. And it just it, it just seems like we're playing offense in the phone booth right now. It's just crazy to me. You know you know why that is? It's because you have a quarterback that's not like a top-level quarterback. Essentially, when you don't have the, like a guy that can, can overcome mistakes, everything has to be perfect. And I get like from a – a coaching standpoint, you coach perf perfection. You obviously go, obviously go for that. You go for perfect, you know, perfecting your execution, to perfecting your your technique, your discipline, and all that type of stuff. And if you are perfect, you sh you should win the game. Um, but you there's going to be mistakes that happen in the game, 
and you have to be able to overcome them. And clearly, like like this version of the Cleveland Browns can't overcome these mistakes. You like last year, um, it, it everything seemed to fall into place when even even when it was perfect, like it they just were continually able to execute. Um, you know, they rarely had you know pre snap penalties and stuff like that. So it's to me, it's it's it all comes down to the quarterback. If the quarterback is playing well, if you've got I mean, if you got Aaron Rodgers, you got Tom Brady, and you get a uh, false star or offensive holding on first down or whatever, you're like, okay, this is you know not a big deal. But like for the Browns, it's like it's a death sentence, you know. So that really just comes down to the quarterback because everything the court like an offensive coordinator or play caller does is based on what the quarterback can do. He comes into the headset is like, why didn't you hit this receiver that I, I designed this play for that was wide open down the middle of the field? You had time to hit him, right? Why why didn't you do that? So it's like at that point, it's like as a coordinator, you're questioning, all right, these plays that I had designed, like I don't know if he can actually hit, execute them, right? So it's like it all manifests itself from that, and that's why that's why things are kind of like look like that, where you, things have to be perfect. If you're if you're Stefanski and people are telling you. Hey, the play calling was horrible. Play calling is trash, right? We don't got no vertical passing game. Everybody in the city is on it. At what point do you say, you know what? Like, actually, I do call pretty good plays. And actually, if you, you had coaches film, you would see that he was open where I told him to throw the ball and he didn't throw it. Right. At what point in time do you go into the offseason and say, look, I didn't draft him. Sean McVay had Jared Goff. He didn't draft him, right? But he, he, he got the absolute most he could out of him for – what a, a season and then it was like he had to eke out wins and and you know production and stuff like that because the you know off defense is kind of caught up to what that offense does and it's like okay well I'm limited I'm limited because of what my quarterback does and you know you essentially and you, t- you go to your general manager you go to ownership it's like listen like I know that you drafted this guy and we just we just paid him a whole boatload of money and we thought that we might be able to you know he might be able to develop these parts of his game he just hasn't. And so he's handcuffing this offense. So as a you look at that type of situation, they went out and they spent multiple first round picks to go get a, an upgrade at the quarterback position. I think from a Kevin Stefanski to ownership type of thing, like that's going to have to be the same thing unless Baker Mayfield can prove us wrong in the, in the last nine games of the season and take you into the playoffs and show you, hey, no, I, I'm back on track. I can read defenses and stuff like that. But what we're seeing right now on the field is that he double clutches everything. He's late on a lot of throws. Even, you know, one throw that's being debated about all over Twitter and social media <laughs> yeah. and stuff like that is, is the throw to OBJ on the seam ball. You you can't throw it late. Like, that was that ball was, was out late. Like, sure, it might have been, like, out late by a third of a second, but a third of a second in the NFL is an it's eternity. Huge. It's you huge. can't – and then you miss him, right? And so you're expecting OBJ, who's running full speed down the middle of the field – into closing safeties to be able to to throttle down and twist his body back and up to try to make a play on that ball final throw of the game where he threw it to Jarvis Landry and everybody's dogging on Jarvis Landry for dropping that pass that wasn't a good throw he was late look at the tape he came out of the break Baker double clutched it waited waited for that he was sure that he was open and then threw him tight he threw it into tight co- contested coverage when if he just throws it out of his break, he catches that ball with nobody around him. Guys closing. Sure. Maybe within after, you know, when the ball gets there, two yards would have been caught or maybe it he would have dropped it still. But the thing is like, it wouldn't have been a contested catch that he needed to make. Cause I, I'm aware uh, of the reason why people are very hesitant to criticize the quarterback play in Cleveland. I'm aware of it. I get it. You know, it, it's, it's just like, you know, you, you get out of a, a divorce with your high school sweetheart. Like, you guys thought it was forever. Like, and you woke up one day and she said, this ain't working for me. She walks out on you, then takes half of your stuff. Now you're sitting here like, I, I, I'm, I don't know if I can do this no more. I, then you meet another girl, right? You meet her, she's not even half the girl the other girl was, <laughs> but you take her regardless because you 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 just want somebody. You got her now. And now your buddies are telling you, hey, bro, I, I know you, <laughs> this new girl you're dating. <clears throat> I mean, come on, bro. She, 
Yeah, she she you she, sound you sound like you're telling a story from uh, personal experience. I'm, I'm like, <laughs> we might we, we're not talking about me or anybody that I would know, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then we like, but no, nah, but she you start talking about the good things she can do. You know, some days, man, she do cook every Thursday, and you just trying out so hard because you feel like, man, I don't want to go back to the to the times where I just didn't have nothing. And that's what the Browns are at right now. It just it just seems tough for me. It just it's does. Good, it's a good analogy, though. It's a good analogy. It, it really is kind of like that, where it's like you you had a, a large period of time where you didn't have good quarterback play, and finally you get a quarterback that, like, I'm not, we're not saying that Baker Mayfield's bad. He's not a bad quarterback. He's an average dude that has hot streaks, and then he also has games where it's like it doesn't look I mean, he looks really, he looks bad and then all it's an all encompassing that becomes out to like an average type of dude. And you have to ask yourself, do you want an average dude that can win you, you know, maybe, you know, seven to, to 11 games a year, uh, maybe get you into the playoffs here and there, get you a playoff win, but never really kind of contend for the Super Bowl because he's, you know, he isn't good enough to get you to that Super Bowl. Or do you want a guy that can get you to the Super Bowl? Around the AFC North is brought to you by Manscaped. Who is the best in men's below the waist grooming champions of the world? Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family and your jewels. Manscaped just launched their fourth generation trimmer, the Lawn Mower 4. And I'm going to tell you what, this is freaking awesome, guys. Listen, this thing is sleek. This thing is cool. It runs very efficiently. And best of all, it does not cut you where you're most sensitive at. Don't get yourself twisted. This is the barbershop. I would not tell you about something that don't clean you up right. You're going to get the Lawnmower 4. Uh, you heard that right, the 4. And you can join over 2 million people worldwide who trust Manscaped. With the exclusives offers for you today, 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code BARBERSHOP at manscaped.com. Imagine shaving with a sleek, well-designed and optimized trimmer that makes shaving time your favorite time in the bathroom. Manscaped engineered the groin, ultimate groin and body trimmer by focusing on intelligent functionality and an incredibly comfortable grooming experience. Their fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. It even allows you to customize your trim uh, through additional guard lengths. Man, if, you, if you've been shaving with the same nut trimmer on your face, you've been doing it wrong. Don't do you know, that, man. Nobody, don't do that. Uh, you could do it with your face, but if you don't want to mix them, mix and match there. So <laughs> I'll tell you uh, what, get yourself a new one. <laughs> I will tell you what, one of the things we talk about all the time is with these kind of tram trimmers and stuff is the cut. I thought, you know, you're kind of apprehensive because I've cut myself before and it hurts whether it's on your face, but you know, it really hurts down there. Also, they do a really good job of coming out with other different products. Uh, right now, this is the crop preserver. If you use deodorant under your arms, why not use deodorant down there? This is clean, it feels effective and it gives off no residue. That's what we're looking for when you're a big guy as well. And they have a handy dandy spray, which really help you out as well. Um, this is the Crop Reviver. Keeps you down there, keeps everything smooth and ready to go. And trust me, the significant other will like it. So get 20% off and free shipping with the code BARBERSHOP at manscaped.com. The 20% off with uh, free shipping at Manscaped and use the code word BARBERSHOP unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with manscaped i'm gonna say two words deshaun watson what comes to mind so yeah uh, i mean he's a good quarterback um good quarterback in a dicey situation that's kind of what my that that's my thought process when i when i hear that name right like if he didn't have a dicey situation and he's like wanting out of houston you try to go get that guy but i, I mean it, I, I think it would have to get bad <laughs> I think it would have to get bad for them to even yeah. talk about that. That it would need the Browns would need to like have one of the most epic collapses down the stretch and have nothing in the reserve tank for for what they're going to do in the off season. Um, reason I people ask me this all the time. It's not just me being like speculative. People ask me about Deshaun Watson every single day in my inbox, and somebody said something today. Um, there's a guy, I, I ordered some Jimmy, Jimmy John's, 
He, they, they brought it to the house extra fast. He was there. He knocked on the door. He saw that I paid with a credit card. He's like, hey, G. Bush, I'm just saying, man. I mean, Deshaun Watson, he's like, if you think about it, we did sign Kareem Hunt. That's, you know, that's Kareem. Like, I, when, 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 when people, like, talk about, you know, Deshaun Watson, it's like, we're, we're not going to, the team's not going to take on a situation like that. It's like, well, what about Malik McDowell and Kareem Hunt? It's like, oh. there's a difference. There's like an isolated incident with Kareem Hunt that mm-hmm. he's just, he's atoned for. He admitted his fault and he paid his dues and he's, he, all that stuff. Whereas Deshaun Watson, there are, 22 civil cases and what, like 13 other criminal cases or something like that. Like there's, uh, and he's, he's basically not settling. He's not even come out. Like, has he come out in public to like apologize for anything like that? Like he's, he's He's silent on the situation. Well, let me ask you this question. I like to play devil's advocate right here. While we here, we get some good content in. If the trade went down, what percentage of people do you think would complain if they knew he wasn't going to jail, if they knew, so like you already know that like he's been exonerated and all that stuff. The league, he's been on the exempt list. We're going to take it as time served for this year. He sat out that year. That was the year he was already on paperwork. He, if you trade for him, he's ready to go. He's been cleared. He has to do some civil stuff. And but if you if you do want to move after him, he will be available in 2022. How many of them would have a problem with it? Probably 70 to 80% of them. So by 80%, after the trade took place, right? After the season would start, I, I would be willing to wager it would be down to about 30. Oh, I mean, once it's just like you, it's just like the Kareem Hunt thing, right? Like there's a lot of players that are not a lot of players, but fans that were like, well, we, he's, he's a, you know, he's a bad person, everything like that. But then he starts playing and it's like, you forget about it. Like there's a small section of people that, that cling on to that type of stuff. It's the same same thing with the Tyreek Hill type stuff. People don't care about their politicians, really their clergymen, or their favorite players doing anything. It comes down to the bottom line. Did I get some tax breaks? Vote. Did I did my quarterback get some wins? Vote. <laughs> like it's just like that's just what it is. When we get back, we'll get to the Cleveland Browns going against the Cincinnati Bengals, the X Factors, keys to the game. G Bush John Costco on the Browns preview show on the Barbershop Network. Costco's PFF grades are brought to you by BetUS.com. Bet with the three-decade leader, BetUSA.com. Join now for 125% bonus or 200% bonus with crypto. Use the promo code BARBERSHOP and bet sports, casinos, horses, pop culture, and more at BetUS.com. You bet, you win, you get paid. BetUS. BetUS has been serving clients for 25 plus years and prides itself on being known as America's favorite sports book. With action on every sport across the world, we can pretty much guarantee that we've got your game. BetUS offers the industry's biggest retail bonus to keep our players betting longer. The BetUS loyalty program is legendary. We keep our players up to date with articles, players, teams, stats, and trends, giving you the right tools to make the best wagering decisions make sure you guys check out betus.com and use the promo code barbershop betus.com all right so let's get into this game um this was a game where you know like you said you did foreshadow a little bit the the Bengals did lose to the jets last week just so to show you any given sunday anybody can get beat anytime any place you know i asked you this last year when you was on on the radio show i said man right now and this is when Baker was actually playing good, right? I'll give you credit for this. He was playing good, and I was like, would you take Joe Burrow over Baker Mayfield? And you was like, yeah, he, yeah, I, I take him over that. And people went crazy. Cats was all Did in they? The, they went crazy. <laughs> oh, my goodness. The calls was ridiculous. Like, it was blasphemous. It, it was almost like you just – I don't know. You, you just spit on the Pope or something, bro. You just it. People went crazy. This connection between Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase is is electric. Uh, it it was everything that was that it was billed to be and more, um, which is incredible, right? So like Joe Burrow, the first two weeks of the season, coming off that ACL injury, he's you know I'm gonna I take away those first two weeks of the season because you're you're kind of getting back into the flow of things. Um, he he didn't look right, like. He didn't look like he just looked like he was second guessing his knee and he wasn't wasn't sure of it. Now we're into the thick of the season. He looks like he's he's perfectly you know comfortable with that. He has a he's tied for number one 
passing grade in the NFL. Um, and, and Jamar Chase is a big part of that, right? When, when they get blitzed, Joe Burrow has a number one grade in the NFL and Jamar Chase has a number one receiving grade in the NFL. So essentially like what happened in that Ravens game, um, they, they, the last year when they played and they blitzed him 25 times in that game and he had like a 29 passing grade. It was awful. But then in this game, when, you know, two weeks ago, when they played him, they blitzed him 15 times, but he, he shredded them for like 240 yards had like an 88 passing grade. Jamar Chase had like a 92 pa- uh, receiving grade in that, you know, uh, CJ Uzoma or Uzama or whatever, you, however you pronounce it. I you know Bengals Twitter put that out and everything, but <laughs> he had two, you know, two touchdowns there and, and, and it just lit them up and they had to call off the dogs because it's like, he's shredding us. We have to stop. We have to do something different to be able to try to stop this offense. And they, they couldn't, they couldn't stop it. So to me, they're the number one team in, this, in the AFC North, and they're a legitimate threat to to. I don't I don't know if they're they're good enough to make it to the Super Bowl, but like, I, I mean, I, I love Joe Burrow as a quarterback. He's a stud, and he's playing at an extremely high level. And if you can, they have the problem is that they have the third hardest schedule remaining in this in the NFL. So like, even if they are might be the best team in in the NFL or not the NFL, but the the AFC North it might not show that in the end end of the season records though. The Ravens have the fifth hardest moving forward. Browns have the ninth hardest moving forward and really doesn't matter for the Pittsburgh Steelers or the 12th hardest, but they're not, they're not going to be a threat in this division. I got a question. So who, who would you, who would you, who would you rather have, um, you know, say you t- go back to 2020, the NFL draft. The Browns were looking at uh, obviously offensive tackle, and they, they took Jedrick Wills at number ten overall. Would you rather have Jedrick Wills or Justin Jefferson? This sucks. Let me let me tell you why I'm prefacing it. It sucks because even if they did draft Justin Jefferson, he still wouldn't get the ball. So here's the thing, right? So Joe Burrow. <laughs> Joe Burrow, right, got his guy. So, like, this is the same debate that the that the, the Bengals had this year, right? Every, everybody and their mother were saying they need to draft an offensive lineman, a left tackle to protect. They need to get Panay Sewell to protect Joe Burrow because he got hit so much last year. And look, I hate that, that they cliche. Just, and it's like, it's like, well, no, we're going to go get Jamar Chase because we need options for Joe Burrow to throw it to instead so that he can get rid of the ball quickly. Like, look at what Ben Roethlisberger did in his game against the Browns. He got rid of the ball in 2.2 seconds. Like, and, and you know, he got sacked twice or whatever, once by my Miles Garrett, but he got rid of the ball so quickly so and, and so frequently that Miles Garrett only generated four pressures in this game, even though there were an additional eight times where he defeated that left tackle in this game, but it was out so quickly he could didn't generate a pressure or people that are fans do not value receivers. They just, they think like they're just not, they're not useful that, you know, you can win without them. I'd rather play with tight ends. It's literally to the point where I think that people would rather play with mediocre average players for some odd reason, instead of elite guys, that are playmakers that can change. Maybe it's because you, you don't have to worry about them leaving or you, you don't have to, you know, I, I don't know what it is, but people somehow believe that the value is there's no value in receivers. Like they're a diamond dozen, go get another guy. And I just don't understand where that, where that thought process comes from. The analogy here, right. Of who do you want Justin Jefferson or Jedrick Wills or whatever. It's like, who, who are the offensive linemen for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Can you name them? I can't name no other lineman. Let's just yeah, who cut, their, cut who to are, that. Who are their wide receivers? Who are their wide receivers? Man, you know what? They got Mike Evans. They got Godwin. Antonio Brown. Antonio Rob Brown. They got Scotty Miller. They got Tyler Johnson. Just they keep, got. I mean, they they got weapons galore. And like I know, I know who the offensive linemen for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are. They have Ali Marpet. They've got Tristan Wirfs. They got good players there, right? Donovan Smith. They've got good players on offensive line, but the thing is, is that like they're 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 deadly, not because of like their offensive line. They're deadly because of a Tom Brady and that those receivers he throws to. The reason why the Browns run these thirteen personnel's and stuff like that is because 
they don't have receivers to be able to put out there that are consistently going to get open and be a threat. If, if, if I was skeptical about the Browns against the Steelers, and, and I told people like this, I, I just don't believe, you know, the Browns are, are really in a dogfight when it comes to these playoffs. I mean, I, I don't feel comfortable saying the Browns are going to beat the Bengals at all. I, I didn't feel comfortable saying they're going to beat the Cardinals. I definitely didn't feel comfortable even against the Steelers. What makes me believe or what makes you believe that the Browns can win this game against the, the Bengals? Uh, it, it's a lot to overcome of what went down today when you've got a player in that on that team that's a the superstar, essentially the world famous superstar that was liking the you know negative posts about Baker Mayfield. And how do you rectify that and get over that? Uh, offensively, what, what what can they do? We've seen the game plan. What can they do against the Bengals to to try to generate more than ten points? I mean, like like you said, they they have to be able to throw the football because what teams are starting to do is is load the box to stop this run game, and they're just essentially daring Baker Mayfield to throw the ball, and it's working. It, it's just flat out working right now. Um, you know, either Arizona Cardinals ran a, ran a six two defense to stop the run game. They did. And then Baker Mayfield couldn't throw it. Um, you know, the and Patrick Sears essentially did the same thing, daring Baker Mayfield to throw it, and he and he couldn't. You know, make the plays when they're there, and then like not pass up open reads that are there. So like the, it's just they have to be able to to execute the offense because there are open receivers on plays, and Baker Mayfield needs to find those guys and get them the ball. And that, that's essentially what it is for me. It's like on on the defensive side of the football. Um, you know, the Browns gave up 15 last week. What do they got to do this week to, to at least give the offense a little bit of a chance against one of the, the most firepower in the game right now with the with the Bengals? You're going to have to be able to get pressure with four and and also make Joe Burrow hold on to the ball um, and, instead of being able to get rid of it super quick. So, like, I, you know, I had mentioned that Joe Burrow was the number one quarterback against the Blitz. Um, he's He's – been fantastic in that regard so being able to affect them without blitzing which is easier said than done right so like if you get him under pressure his grade is a 60 this year his grade when he's kept clean is a 91 against the blitz it's a 94.4 so when you don't blitz him uh his grade is a 73 so it's like understanding what it is that if you keep him in the pocket make him hold on to the ball longer um you're going to be able to maybe affect him that way but essentially when he's getting blitz he's getting rid of it in 2.4 seconds which is you know you know pretty quick um but when when you are able to get him under pressure he's holding on to it for three three point two seconds so it's it's a matter of that's what you have to do to be able to get to stop joe burrow and then you're gonna have to play you know kind of like some some exotic coverages on the back end to make him hold on to the ball so that that press that rush can get there because they don't have a good offensive line. But like we always talked about is to be able to mitigate a good pass rush is to get rid of the ball quickly. Let's get to my X factor X factors on the offensive side of the football. Baker Mayfield sports, sports always gives you an opportunity to redeem yourself and to prove people wrong. It's the greatest thing about sports and why I love sports because it don't matter what I say, Costco say. Now that stuff is on Twitter, the way you can respond is going out there and putting up some big numbers and people will shut up for a week. Who's your uh, offensive, uh, you know, X factor? So since you took Baker Mayfield, who it's, I think it's clearly on him. Um, you could yeah. you could have took him too. Baker's season last year basically turned around in a game at Cincinnati after getting – embarrassed against the Pittsburgh Steelers, just like it is now, <laughs> you know, and he had 297 yards, five touchdowns, a pass rating of 157, a grade that was like 90, like a 97 grade during that stretch, astronomical numbers. So, you know, he can play like at that level. Now he, he, he needs to be able to play like at that level at a consistent basis. You know, let's get to the defensive X factors. My defensive X factor. I'm going to go up front because, I, you know, with the game plan you're talking about, trying to get pressure with four, mixing some looks up in the back end, you're going to need something from, you know, Malik uh, Jackson. I think they're going to need to be doing a lot of stunning up front. I think to generate that pressure, moving alignments, maybe even having guys stand up so they don't know where you're coming from. Um, blitz bluffing so I really think that, that Malik Jackson is a guy for me because they're going to need to get that push in the middle so that you know Miles Garrett and Jadavian Clowney when they collapse the pocket Malik Jackson 
is still there with Malik McDowell to kind of clean up some of those sacks um, and some of those those passing lanes. So I'm going to go with Malik Jackson. Who do you got? I'm going to do it again. I'm going to say it's Ronnie Harrison um, because like I was doing with John Johnson, waiting for him to have a good game and, and that pull something out. I need Ronnie Harrison to step up um, and Harrison needs to stop with these stupid penalties. And he's given up six touchdowns this year and only broken up two passes. Whereas last year he gave up, I think just one touchdown and broke up five passes and had an interception as well. Um, so he needs this to be, he needs to step it up and needs to play like at the level he was playing last year, which was a was a really quality safety. Let's go to our final predictions for this game. Can the Browns win? Sure. But I'm going to have to start picking against them until they show me what they're talking about because I got to be true to what the game is. You know, you at some point in time have to show that you can beat good teams. And I just don't think the Browns, have beat enough good teams over these last two years. I think they beat some mediocre teams. I think they beat some yeah above average teams, but I don't think they beat any great teams. And I don't think they play well when they're up against teams that are top notch type level, uh, you know, football teams. So for me, I, I can't, I can't come out here and say to the Browns, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt because this is an adversity week. This is a week we all going to find out what you guys are about because you can simply go out there and get blown out. It, it, it can happen. The Bengals are that good where you can get it embarrassed. And then it's a really, you know, what show on Twitter after the game, I got them losing this game, being honest with you, bro. I got the Browns losing this 31, 31, 17, 31, 17 against the Bengals. To me, I'm going to, I'm going to go with, I think like 34, 14 type, type deal. Like it's just not going to be even, it's going to look like, the, it's going to look like the Cardinals game. Yeah, I, you know, to me, you let us know. Put it in the comment section below. Who do you got winning this game? And tell me the path you see for the Browns getting a victory on offense and on defense. But for this episode, we will wrap it up. For G. Bush, John Costco, this is the Browns preview show on the Barbershop Network. <laughs> <laughs>